Okay, so my name is Luka Jakubowicz, and this is Functional Conf, as you may all know. Um, and my talk is going to be about testing in the world of functional programming. Um, and just to preface a bit, it's going to be a bit opinionated. Um, it's also going to be, it's also going to represent a lot of the problems that we faced uh, in our team. Um, it might not always completely apply to everyone, but these are just some of the some of the lessons I learned um, for about a year or so doing functional pro uh, purely functional programming in production. Um, so, without further ado, a bit about me. So, as I said, my name is Luca Jakubowicz. Um, I'm a software developer at Codecentric in Germany. Uh, I also co-organize some meetups, uh, Scala and Idris meetup in Dusseldorf. Um, I also maintain some uh, some open source libraries such as uh, various cats libraries, cats, cats effect, cats MTL, cats tagless. Uh, if you have any questions or anything or ideas about those, come to me. I also maintain uh, this library called Outwatch. And I'm also super enthusiastic about functional programming, which is the whole reason I'm here in India. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's look at the agenda real quick. Uh, I'm going to talk about only three things. Um, well actually, it's just two things in conclusion. So the first thing I really want to talk about is property-based testing, because property-based testing really helps um, getting more confidence in your tests. And then the second thing is about mocking. Yeah, mocking in functional programming. It's a bit different from, um, from the way you might want to mock you in Java, so we'll have uh, an in-depth look uh, about that. Okay, and at the end, we'll just try to find some conclusions. Okay, so property-based testing is really, really awesome. So who here knows about property-based testing? Okay, that's quite a few. So um, in essence, property-based testing lets you generate test cases, right? And that means that you can no longer, like it, it takes away your ability to cheat. And that means that um, if you write a function and you want to test that, you give this function some inputs and you have some expected output, right? But if you, um, if, you, if, you, if you don't use property-based testing, if you just test manually, you can kind of cheat by just choosing just the right inputs where this function works perfectly. And even if you don't cheat, you might have some edge cases where, okay, you know about these edge cases of your function, so you manually uh, test these edge cases. But we all know that over time and over a lot of refactorings, uh, things in your code base tend to change a lot. So these edge cases, they're not always, they don't always stay the same, right? So over time, your edge cases might, might change a bit or they even, they might be, they might get more edge cases. So, uh, and of course, we as programmers, we, if we, um, if we change something in the code, we should always change it, uh, change it to reflect in the tests as well. But as a lot of you may know that uh, sometimes we tend to forget or we set, tend to overlook certain things. So property-based testing takes away that, so you can no longer manually input any, uh, you can no longer manually write the inputs to your function. So you just let the, the uh, property-based testing framework generate a bunch of them, and that helps us find bugs as early as possible because we don't have to think about what are the edge cases because it, uh, the framework just says, hey, you cheated here, uh, write a function that works for all of our input cases. Um, and this is where some of the problems are. And uh, the next I'm going to talk about some of the pains where property-based testing can, can be a bit difficult. So the first thing is, how, have you ever seen a function like this? So this function called UUID created after, it's in Scala, uh, in case you don't know it. Um, and it takes a UUID as a string and a date as a string and then returns a Boolean if the UUID was created after that date. And uh, there's this nice comment that says, oh, okay, this should use, this should use uh, UUID version one, and also the date should be in this format. Um, and if you try to write a property-based test for this, you'll probably run into uh, errors real quick that say, hey, this function doesn't work for any strings. So we're kind of lying, like this, 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 um, this function doesn't really set out the requirements right, right? the inputs to this function should not be two strings, because strings could represent nearly everything. What we want 
is a UUID and a date. And so what, what can we do about that? So how can we, how can we kind of fix this problem? And one, one thing you can do is you can use new types. So what are new types? New types basically say, okay, um, instead of having a, uh, using the primitive types like string and integer, which have uh, a enormous, um, <coughs> enormous amounts of values that it could possibly have, right? For example, this date that we saw earlier could also just be a string of Chinese characters, which usually doesn't parse very well as a date. So a new type basically says, hey, let's constrain this type, um, or can, new types can say, okay, we want only a subtep, subset of the possible values a certain type can have, right? So string can have a lot of values, but for dates we only want maybe a subset of that, or we want to encode it differently altogether. So, and there are some common reasons against new typing. In, in Scala, they are usually uh, written as um, any val classes, so value classes, um, if you've seen those before. And so let's, let's just look at the common reasons why you wouldn't want to use them, and let's try to work against them and see how we can uh, address them one by one. So the first one is it won't support the operations I need. So for example, if I new type a number to, for example, use uh, a rupees, for example, now um, I can no longer uh, add two, two values of this together. And I can't say, oh, I just want to uh, maybe like $5 plus $5 should be $10, but now I don't have this plus operation anymore. So it can get quite annoying, and that feeds into the second reason, which is it will lead to a lot of boilerplate conversions where, oh, okay, now in order to add these two values together, I need to convert them to int, and then afterwards I have to convert them back, and now I've written a lot of things that just seem a lot of boilerplate. -y. And of course, what what um, another problem is is that it can give us a performance penalty, right? So sometimes, uh, especially in Scala, any val classes, when we um, new type something, it will automatically uh, box and unbox whenever we add it, for example, to a list or we use it inside of an option. And um, in general. These, this can lead to a lot of allocations and deallocations, which of course leads to more, um, to more memory, uh, to, to higher GC load, and it gives us a general like, performance penalty. So, um, how can we deal with this? So let's have a look. There's a really nice library in Scala. It's called Scala New Type, and it basically takes away most of these problems. Um, it's, it, it kind of also gives us a glimpse into Scala's future because I think most of the features Scala new type has will just be like uh, features in, in I think Scala 3 if, if everything goes well. Um, so let's have a look. So first thing we do is we just write a case class and say, hey, let's add this add new type uh, annotation. And now we have a euros new type that basically at runtime is just going to be an integer, right? So this euros gets completely uh, eliminated, and um, unlike value classes, it won't, it, it will never box. So it will always be this Java Lang integer. Um, and what we can do with this, also, what 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 else this gives us is uh, type class automatic type class derivation. So if this type that we're wrapping in our new type, this integer, has certain um, certain type class instances. We can also get these same type class instances for our euros class. So for example, if you wanted to do something like this, where we'd say, okay, I want, because euros are fundamentally, they're numeric, right? I can add them, I can subtract them. Um, this means basically that what we can do is say, okay, we can define um, a numeric instance for euros just by deriving it from the int. And hopefully this is something that will uh, come to Scala 3. So um, in the future, you might see more of this if you're doing a lot of Scala. And what we can do then, just by using the syntax defined for numeric, is say, okay, well, let's just add these up, and this plus will uh, just use the numeric syntax, and this will just work. So this is all the code you basically need to get this compiled. And now you don't have to convert from one to another, and it, it makes a lot of things a lot nicer. Okay. So another real cool thing that I want to show you is this library called Refined. And Refined um, basically gives you the ability to limit the, um, limit the amount of values, the, the set of values 
any given type can have. Um, so let's look at an example. So let's say I want um, a string that represents some URL. Usually when I just say a string, I can write anything and it's easy to get it wrong. You might have some, you might uh, get it from some user input and he might have done something wrong so you have to clean up his input. So what, what you can do is you can use this string refined URL type um, and this will, at compile time, check if this literal right here um, is, is a valid URL. And if it is, it will compile, everything's fine. And if it's not, it will say, okay, I can't do that. So for example, something like this, where we got the wrong protocol, we use HRRP, which is probably a typo. Um, at compile time, it will say, hey, this URL predicate failed. I don't know of this protocol HRRP. And this is really cool. And what we can do as well is do things like int refined positive, where we say, okay, we only want a positive integer. We, there's tons of other different refinements in refined. And uh, what we see here is this static refinement where we refine literals. Um, but, it, but, the, but usually for, for non-literals, right? So when we get a value from user input for a string that's supposed to be a URL, we can't say, oh, okay, let's just uh, make it, like this. we can't check it at compile time because it's the, we don't have the value at compile time. We only get the value at runtime. So what we have to do is say, okay, let's refine this. And then what we get is an either an error or the valid refined URL string, right? So this is basically how we do it. So, and this gives us the best of both worlds for, for, um, for, for literals. We can just say, oh, okay, you can check this at compile time so you know it's a refined URL. Uh, and for, for, for things where we don't have any control over, for things that we have to get at runtime, now you can say, okay, uh, just give me back an either where the left case is the error and the right case is the value that we actually wanted to refine. Okay, and what's really cool about this is that with Scala check, which is one of the, the, the most widely used um, Scala property-based testing framework, these two, they have a module called Refined Scala check that defines um, generators for all of the refined um, types. So what we could do, for example, uh, we need to just import this, and then if we have this left pad function, which pads a string to the left and adds uh, just space characters, um, and what we do is we say, okay, for any string and for any int refined positive, that means that um, we can't give it a negative in integer because it doesn't make sense to pad a string with negative amount of characters, right? So we want a positive integer. Um, and I'm not gonna write the implementation. What we can then say, and this is um, the, the Scala check syntax basically, we can say for all, for all uh, S, which is a string, and N, which is, an which is a positive integer, we can say, okay, for any, um, if we left pad that string with N, that length should be either equal or larger to, to, to n, right? So if, if, if the string was already larger than n, then of course the padded one uh, will also be larger. But if, um, if the string was smaller, then uh, the padding will also, be, um, will also make it larger. So what we get is uh, a property-based test that will actually check all of these values um, correctly. And if we just used int here, we might get some minus, uh, we might get some negative numbers and then this test kind of would fail, right? And this kind of gives us back the confidence that, okay, um, this function will work as expected. Yes, so exactly, that's a good point. Uh, sorry, I didn't explain that. Um, so yes, if for, is, this is going to, like depending on your configuration, but usually, this is going to generate about 100 different string and in integer pairs. And then we we'll run this function with that. Okay, um, so what I'm trying to tell you here is that whenever you only accept valid inputs for your functions, that doesn't just make it easier to property-based test, but it also makes your code a lot more precise because you can no longer call this functions, you can no longer call these functions with values that it doesn't accept. So you kind of restrict the input uh, values for your function, then that makes it a lot easier, not just to property-based test, but also to think about what your function could actually be doing. 
So, and there are a lot of, lot of more of these different kind of gems out there. So, Refine has a lot of these things, but there's also uh, some other really cool libraries. So, let's see. Um, for example, what we can do is uh, if we use a non-empty list, and sometimes you might want to aggregate um, values that are in a non-empty list and then divide by the size to get the average, right? And the problem here is, can be that um, because uh, if you look at the size function or the length function of lists and non-empty lists, they actually return an integer. And an integer is not guaranteed to be positive. But a non-empty list always has positive integers as its length, right? So a non-empty list can never be have length zero because it wouldn't be non-empty. And with refine, you get this refine size method, which will give you an interfine positive. And now you have the guarantee that when you're, for example, calculating the average, you're going to uh, divide by a, by a positive number. And that will, can maybe after some refactorings, um, if you don't do this, it can lead to some, to some uh, division by zeros er errors that happened to us. So we, we introduced this and now it's all smooth sailing. No more runtime errors, it's really nice. Um, and for those that like to do uh, validation using uh, cats validated instead of either, there's also th something like this where you can say, hey, I wanna use um, a validate function instead of refining to either, and then you get a validated NEL um, of the errors and the valid SH, SHA1, right? And that is just, um, well, SHA1 um, uh, hash, uh, and it just checks if it's valid. Okay, and in general, I, I've tried to come up with like a few examples of this and what you can use instead. So if you use a duration of time, if you need a duration of time, Scala has this neat type called finite duration and also duration for infinite durations. Um, and you can use that instead of using just integer because it gives you the units. And for example, one error that can occur is if you have one duration in seconds and you have another duration in milliseconds and now you you forget that there are different types, so you add them up, and then you uh, then you have a problem. So with finite duration, these things can't happen because the the uh, the actual duration is um, stored along with the actual duration type. So it's uh, it's either one second, one millisecond, and then you can just uh, go from there. Uh, for non-empty sequences, you can you should be using non-empty list because uh, it gives you a lot of different guarantees. You can now call it something like reduce on it safely and also maximum and minimum um, because maximum and minimum usually don't make any sense if you have an empty list. Uh, for dates, please don't use strings. Use something like local date, which, is, uh, for, which was introduced in Java 8 and uh, I think everyone should be using Java 8. Almost everyone should be using Java 8. Is anyone not using Java 8 yet or something earlier? No? Perfect, cool. So use this local date, it's, it's nice. It's a lot better than Java uh, SQL date or Java util date. Um, use, uh, if you wanna save an IP address or want to take an IP address, please don't use uh, a string, just use something like a string refined IPv4 or IPv6 if that's what you need. Uh, and you get the idea, right? So try to use these strong types that give you guarantees that your data is actually valid. So whenever you try to write a function, and then try to write a test for it, you might, be need, uh, you might see that, oh man, I've got a lot of these cases where a string just doesn't cut it. Uh, and so you can check something like refine to see if there's something out there, and usually there is, because there's only so many cases you might have. Uh, and if there's not, you can always model it yourself, for example, using like a case class, a seal trait, uh, something like that in general. And there's really, really cool other libraries. Um, I've hinted at this before. And one of these is called Libra, which is a dimensional analysis library. And uh, it gives us like these different unit of measures. Um, so for example, we can multiply two meter values and then instead of receiving the same meter value, we actually get uh, a square meter value. And then we can divide that by another meter value and then we get back a meter value. So it actually knows like what these multiplication um, and division operators are doing. And it's really nice. Um, and FUUID, is a functional UUID library where um, usually when you when you create a new random UUID, um, yeah, this this is usually considered a side effect because it uh, it, it, it won't uh, it's not referentially transparent because every time you call the function, it will give you a different result, so it's not deterministic. Um, and if you want to create one from string, 
you can just do that. You can just UUID dot from string and it will throw an exception. Usually that's not what you want. So um, FUID fixes that by just returning random UUIDs in IO and uh, it'll use either for constructing a UUID from a string. And squants, which is very similar to Libra, but also comes with a lot of like built-in uh, units of measure. So you have s stuff like kilowatts and tons, and it also knows about these uh, different things. So for example, if you would say, oh, I have five kilowatts, and then I want to um, divide that by a certain amount of money to get like kilowatts, how many kilowatts can I get for your money? Um, and then you might want to multiply that by some other measure, and you can just go crazy with this, and it's, it's really nice. Uh, if, if you actually, if you work with any of these units of measures, I really, and you've, of course, if you work with Scala, I really recommend checking uh, either Libra or Squants out. They're both really nice. So, we learned about, learned about probability-based testing and strong types and how they help. So, how do I go about testing something like this, right? So, we have the sendXML function, which takes a string, parses it, like, as some XML, and then just sends it to some external server. We can't really see. Um, and then if we have a list of like some XML values, um, we want to use, uh, we want to send them all to this server by using the send all function, which is just calling uh, for each and then the send XML. So there's a few, few different things that might be wrong here. So the first thing we can do is say, okay, um, let's split it up. And instead of using, um, instead of using a string, we can first parse it to some XML value. We say, okay, let's parse it. And then we can also say, okay, let's send it. And instead of just returning unit, we'll just return IO unit to uh, uh, regain referential transparency. And now we have these two functions and the first function we can really easily test by saying, okay, we'll give it some, um, some actual XML um, as a string and then it should parse it correctly. And if not, we can, uh, it should just return the left side, a throwable, some kind of exception. Um, so this is nice. And then, of course, we can combine them to create this parse and send function where we just lift um, the parse XML, which returns an either, into IO using this IO from either method, and then flat map it using send XML to get, uh, to just send it then afterwards. So this works. Uh, and of course, if we have a list of these, we can just use the traverse function. To, to do that for any number of lists, any number of elements. So we can test parsing, that's easy, but what about sending? Like how do we test the simple line of code? And I think that's, that's one of the most difficult questions in all of, all, all of software. Like what do you have side effects that uh, use some external service over which you have zero control? How do you test that? And yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's difficult. So testing what we don't control. Um, and here we kind of have like two options that are not mutually exclusive. And the one option, the simple option, is just to say, okay, let's, uh, let's say we have like five sy systems that all talk to each other somehow, and uh, let's fire them all up and then test everything to see if it works, right? And that's integration testing. Uh, but that can be difficult because you don't, you no longer have the ability to introspect each single little thing and integration testing is like it's all its own talk basically because it's there's so many things you need to think about um, so what I'm going to be talking about here is the second option which uses which basically talks about uh, mocking and we, we don't we we separate ourselves from the outside world and try to pull in all of the logic um, by, by using mocking and this is this can be easier because you don't no, no longer have to talk to outside services. You don't no longer have to uh, have to be sure that all of the outside services are actually running. Um, but of course, it's potentially a lot less accurate because you know you can no longer be sure that the mocks you're creating or um, the mocks that you're uh, testing are going to behave in the same way uh, that the real service is actually going to do. So I'm going to take a quick drink. And then we're going to talk about how we use mocking to test AI. <coughs> okay, so let's say we have, um, let's say we want to test some sort of code that uh, 
does a lot of different things. So it might want to log something here. It might want to call into, um, into some service here. Uh, and there's a lot of different things going on. We might want to write something to a file server. And the best thing to do first is to basically disentangle the different kind of types of side effects we want to do. So, and what's best for that is really using this thing called tagless final. And tagless final, um, if you haven't heard about it, uh, basically allows you to separate a problem description from the problem uh, implementation from the solution. So that's what I just said. <laughs> and uh, this means we can define like our own algebras and those define our interactions, right? So for example, if you want to talk to a mail service, we say, let's define an algebra that says, how do we interact with this mail service? Uh, and if we want to talk to some file service, we can define an algebra that defines how we interact with this file service. And this gives us like an extra level of, ex of abstraction, but also uh, it allows us to maintain flexibility because these algebras are very abstract, right? And, but we, in order to actually implement the code that, uh, that will be run, we, will ha we can provide what we call these interpreters. And we can define a lot of different interpreters for the same algebra. And so, for example, for if you want to run things in production, we have a production interpreter. And if you want to do something in testing, we can have a testing interpreter. Um, and this gives us the flexibility to, uh, to disentangle these different things. So how to do this? So let's say, um, uh, let's say we want to create, we want to get started with Tagless Final. So first, we model algebras uh, just as scala traits parameterized with a type constructor. And that's where kind of the effect thing's going on. And then we can create a program simply by using a method and then we constrain this type parameter. Um, for example, with a monad. I said the M word, I'm so sorry. Um, and then interpreters are simply just implementations of these traits. So let's have a look. Uh, so this is the code that we have right now. Uh, we want to book a few things. We want to book a drink, a Coke. Uh, we want to book some womb service. We want to book a sandwich, which should be whole wheat and uh, have hummus. Hummus is great. And now we want to uh, convert this into tagless final and actually be able to test it. So what we do is we create this booking service algebra, right? That's parameterized by this type constructor F. Uh, we say, okay, we can book drinks, we can book other things. So the first thing is we define this book drink function, which takes a beverage and doesn't return anything because it just uh, goes there and returns it, uh, returns nothing because, okay, we'll just, this drink will come up in some time. We, this is just the booking service. It doesn't actually uh, concern how to get that drink to you. And then we can book some room service and also a sandwich, which way you want to specify the dough and also the topping. So this is very simple, most simple as it gets. Um, and now what we can do is we can say, let's define, we define our book things function from before. And we'll, uh, instead of using this for comprehension, since we didn't really need it, um, we can just use this apply write shark function, which says, okay, run this and then run the other things. So we run, uh, we, book the, we book the Coke, we book room service, and then we book our whole wheat hummus sandwich. So this is basically equivalent to the function we saw before, just expressed using our booking service algebra. <coughs> Sorry. This uh, right chart operator. Okay, so basically um, it uses the apply type class, which says that you can run two things um, uh, in parallel and say, um, and do something with the result of both. So this just says, okay, um, run this, run this, and then uh, run the other thing, basically. That's the simplest way to talk about it. Um, there's lots more documentation on this uh, on the CATS website, which I recommend. Uh, of course, I'm biased, but I still recommend it. <laughs> and uh, yes, okay. So let's look at a possible test interpreter. And how, do we, how, how can we test this? Uh, I think the easiest way is to just say, okay, we have a bunch of different orderings, um, and what we care about is the, uh, the only thing that we can really test is the order in which those bookings come in. So we want to test if the order of the bookings is the same 
um, as, as, in the, as in what we specified. So what we can do is we can just reify this booking into an actual value and then try to interpret our, our program into a value of booking and then see um, if, if the order is still the same. So let's have a look. So we create the seal type booking, which can be either a drink uh, a room service or a sandwich booking, right? So far, so good. And now we can create a test service, which is going to be a const of list of booking, right? So a const, in case you don't know, is just something that has two type parameters, but only stores something of the first. So a const of list booking and A, for example, is just a list of booking. Um, this might sound a bit complex, but if you actually get around to using const a bit more often, uh, it, it'll, it'll make sense, I think. So we can, if we want to book a drink, we'll just return a list of a drink booking with the specific beverage. If we want to book some room service, we'll just return a const list of room service booking. And if we want to book sandwich with the dough and topping, we just return a const list of sandwich booking. And what this gives us, if we run this program, because const um, applicative instance is just the uh, monoid instance for a list of booking. So what, what, what will happen is we will run the program using this interpreter, and it will just concatenate the lists together. So since we have a list of booking uh, of drinks and a list of room service booking and then a list of sandwich booking and we had them in this order, it will return a list of these things in that exact order. And now what we can do is we can run this using this test service uh, and then get const turns it from const back into the list of booking. So we get the list of bookings out of our uh, book things uh, program. And then what we say is, okay, we expect the bookings to be in this order. So it's also a list of booking. And then the only thing we need to do is assert that these are the same. So what are we actually testing here? Are we testing the external service? Obviously not, because we're only doing this inside of our own system. Um, so the only thing we're actually doing is testing the internal wiring of our own system. And so I think that everyone that has worked with a lot of like um, abstract code that uses uh, something like I.O. or maybe something that even uses future, you have a lot of wiring, like a large for comprehension that does call things here and things here, and it's easy to test the pure, car, pure part of your program, but sometimes the wiring, where you would basically just call something from an external system, use some pure computation, call another thing, use another pure computations, the wiring is kind of where things can go wrong, or where things tend to go wrong, because the pure part is easy to test but the side effects are the messy thing. So this is what we're trying to test, basically. Um, so what we did was kind of easy, because if you looked at it, all of the uh, things in our algebra just returned unit. And usually we have to deal with much more complex types. Um, so for example, we might want to call something to our email service and that's going to give us back um, an ID that will handle, uh, that we can then later look up if that email actually returns something or if it has actually sent. And we have to think about a lot more things like just than just fire something and forget. Like just write it to file and I don't care if it's actually if it actually wrote to that file or it throwed an error or whatever. Um, and this becomes a lot harder. So what can we do? Uh, two questions you should ask yourself. So if you mock an external service, does that external service just hold data? Does it just give you data? Or, um, or does it maybe just allow you to run some things without caring what they return? Um, usually that is not the case. Usually external services also have some sort of state, like the file system or a database, they both have state, right? So if you write something into a file system or into a database, now it, it has some changed state. And so this is what's difficult. So, and the second question you might want to ask is that how can you, or can you reasonably mimic the behavior of that external service using like a self-contained state machine? So for example, if you want to mimic a database, what we can do is say, okay, let's just use something like the state monad um, to basically say, okay, we hold a, a bunch of different uh, states here and now we can actually model that if we want. So uh, if, the, if the answer to both of these questions, actually if the answer to the second question is yes and the answer to the first question is state, then the next thing I will show you will, will help you a little bit. So let's look at a complex example. So this is what we want to test, right? So we have this function discount all 
Uh, and now we're in some different domain. We want we have like a web shop and we have some customers and discount type and we want to apply um, a specific discount type to a list of customers. Or not just to a list of customers, to all customers. So what we say is, okay, let's just get all the customers from the database, um, then log all of them. Then we want to get a discount for this specific type and the discount might change. So we actually have to call to an Excel service to get the accurate discount. Then we also want to log that discount. We want to update all of the customers. Um, if they're eligible for this discount, we want to actually apply it to them. And then at the end, we want to um, traverse, uh, we want to traverse the updated customers and log them, basically. So this is something, and now we have to try and test it. So let's try disentangling it first. So we can create different algebras. First, we start with this logging algebra, which is or fairly simple. We, uh, log, we know we want to log, be able to log a customer and we want to be able to log some discount, okay, um, using the discount type and a discount. And now the customer service is a bit more complex because here we're doing a couple of things. So get all customers is fairly simple. We just get the list of customers, uh, get discount. Um, it's also fairly simple for every discount type. We want to be able to get a specific discount and now update, update discount of eligible uh, is probably the most complex where we, we, we take a customer um, and a discount and we want to basically update this customer based on that discount and return a new customer that the external service gives us. So this is basically how we would rewrite um, the discount all function using tackles final. So we say for any F that's a monad given a discount type and the ability to use this customer service and logging. We can create an F list of customer and now we just basically run the same steps that we had before. We get all the customers, we traverse to log, we get the discount, we log the discount and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is that. And now we actually want to have two interpreters, right? So the IO interpreter is going to be the same function that we had before and now we also want to have an interpreter that allows us the ability to, to test this. And to be able to test this, we need to actually, this is where the mocking actually begins, right? So now we need to actually mock the behavior of that external service. So we need to write our own is eligible function that instead of calling to the external service is going to kind of do this locally, right? So for if, if I give you a discount on a customer, if he is eligible for that specific discount, return true, else false. And now um, we also want to be able to update a customer by uh, applying the specific discount to that customer. And now we actually want to uh, mimic the state that this service has. And of course this is just an approximation, right? We can never actually completely re-implement that external service, otherwise we wouldn't need that external service. We could just use this, uh, use this to, um, and we wouldn't need it. So what we do is we say, okay, this service has um, a state where it, it stores a list of customers and it also stores uh, some discounts where the, there is a mapping from a discount type to a specific discount. So this is going to be the service, uh, the, the state that our mimicked, our mocked service has. And now we can start writing this test interpreter and it's going to interpret into the state monad um, with this service state as our state so if you know the state monad, um, this might make sense to you. If you don't, this might seem really, really foreign, and I apologize, um, but I think if you can, uh, you can read up, there's tons of material online about uh, the state monad and how it works. So for get all customers, we just say, uh, which is a state of service state and list customers, the only thing we need to do is uh, call state.get, which gives us the current state, um, that is of type service state, and because service state has a list of customers and this discount type mapping, uh, we on, the only thing we need to do is map to the customers to get the list of customers back. For get discount, we just take that service state again using get, and then we get the discounts, which is a map from discount type to discount, uh, and then we just apply that discount type to the map to get back our discount. So far, so good. Now, 
the hard part is actually update discount of eligible because this actually has to modify state, right? The, those two functions, they just get the current state. And this last function, it will actually have to modify. And it didn't fit on the slide, so I created a new one. And this is all of it. Uh, so this is something, and it's a lot of things, but uh, let's have a look uh, to kind of grasp this in detail. So first thing we do is we use the state constructor, which takes a state S, which is service state, and what it will return is an updated state and also the value, which for our case is a customer. So what we'll want to return is an updated state and the customer. And the first thing we'll see is that we use this if eligible function that takes the discount and the customer. And we'll, um, if that is false, it will directly jump to this line here. And that line will just return the things unchanged. So if this, uh, if, if this customer is not eligible, we won't change the state at all. And we'll just leave it unchanged and return the same customer. If he is eligible, We'll update the customer using this update customer function we defined. Um, we'll actually filter out that customer because we just updated him uh, from, from the list. So now we have this without customer is a list uh, of customers without that specific customer. And then we add him back in by using, uh, by copying the service state and putting him back in using this uh, plus double colon. And at the end, we just return the updated um, the updated customer right here. So I hope that kind of made sense. Um, but this is, this is just kind of describing the complexity that you sometimes need. Uh, I think if you take your time and look at this, maybe after if you fully <coughs> grasp the state monad, it will totally make sense, I hope. Um, and now what we can do is we can actually create a property-based test where we say, OK, if we have a list of customers and we have an item, we can actually run tests that should work for all of these. So what we do is we define a discount uh, that is just fixed. It just applies 20% on everything. Um, and we have an expected price that we just uh, get by, by ca calling some code that I haven't included for time's sake. And then what we, now what we actually uh, care to do is we get this state by calling the discount all function, which is the function that we saw at the beginning, which is the tagless final that can be interpreted into both I.O. and the state thing. And we use this test interpreter and a test logger that's just not going to do anything. Um, and of course, we also use the discount type fix so that it actually applies the same discount uh, that we have up top. And now, uh, for state monad, to actually run that state monad, we need to give it an initial state. That's what we defined here in val initial. Um, where we give it the customers that are going to be generated from us, and we also um, give it a map from the discount type fix to the actual discount that we defined up top. And now to actually get that price, we use this state run a function, which just gives us the result. Um, we give it this, uh, we give it the, uh, this should, I'm sorry, there's some, uh, this should actually be initial right here. Uh, I th seem to have made a mistake. Um, so we give it this initial value, um, which then gives us an eval, which we uh, can unwrap using value, and then we fold map using this item.price4 method. And at the end, we get um, the price that we uh, computed, and now we can just assert if that is the same as we expected. And now this should work if everything worked out fine, and in our case, it did. Um, so this gives us the ability to test complex function calls, uh, complex service calls that are effectful using our local service, our, our local machine, basically. So that was a lot to grasp. Um, so let's just recap a bit. So what we can do with this technique is we can mock behaviors of external services by pulling them into our own world, making them fully deterministic. Now we no longer have to say, oh, okay, this only works by, uh, if, if I also have this other service, uh, if this also this other service is running and our HTTP is when we're using the same port and all of that. Uh, but this makes it like fully deterministic. It might not fully represent that external service, but uh, it gives us the, the ability to, uh, to remain fully deterministic. And that's, I think, the key. Um, and of course, this won't make sense for all of our services. Uh, for some services, they're just too complex to just mock them with 
a couple of functions. And I think you should just like evaluate to see, hmm, maybe this makes sense here, maybe it doesn't. Um, in a lot of cases, it won't be feasible, but in some, it can be, it can be, a, it can be a huge help just to um, basically be sure that your internal wiring, your huge for comprehension does exactly what you do, uh, what you want it to do. And in the end, that is what we want is to give uh, us more confidence in the code that we're testing. Okay, so conclusions. Um, that's the, the best thing to do is separate effectful code from pure code um, and make use of total functions that have well-defined inputs uh, where well-defined means that they're restricted in the sense that, um, in the sense that whenever we call it, we uh, only want it to work on the inputs that are actually uh, going to be used by the function. Um, and when testing side effects, see if you can mock some of the behavior. If you can, that's, that's fine as well. Okay, uh, that's, that's all for me. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Luka Jakobowitz and on GitHub. And if you have any questions, I'll be around till tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much.